2,000 years ago, God became man. The creator, the one who spoke the universe into existence, robed himself in his flesh and became a human being. As we've seen in our study, stunningly right now, today, God still is a man. He is the God-man, fully God and fully man. Thus far in our study of John, we've, we've covered some really remarkable truths. We've, enc- we've encountered some really huge theological concepts. And this morning, as we wrap up the prologue, as we wrap up these first 18 verses, as we bring the prologue to a close, we are also here in our text going to cover, uncover some really huge truths about our great God. My purpose this morning is simply to point you to Jesus. We are going to see from our text that he is our fullness and from him we receive grace. We're also going to see that he is our truth and he is the very explanation of God. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be studying verse, we're going to be looking at verse 15 through verse 18 of John 1 and I'll read it to you. It says this, John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll take apart uh, this passage this morning. Okay, let's pray. Father, this morning we are, we are looking to you and I pray for your church this morning. I pray for everyone here at Higher Ground. God, we want to see you. We want to know you. And we know that you have big truths in store for us. So God, I pray that you would reveal yourself to us, that you would make your message clear. Work in our hearts, God. Don't, don't let us leave here unaffected. God, don't let me get in the way of your message. Build up yourself in the hearts of your people. In Christ, let me pray. Amen. If you're taking notes, the first thing that we're going to be looking at this morning is verse 15 through 17. And it is the reality that Jesus is fullness, grace, and truth. Um, the, the whole, the, the message title, the, the summation of this passage is Jesus, fullness, grace, and truth. And starting in verse 15, we're going to see that, that we're going to cover this, this concept of fullness, grace, and truth. So look with me at verse 15. It says this. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Now, if you notice that, uh, if, you, if you're reading out of the ESV like I am, so you know, I'm preaching out of the ESV, and if you're reading out of the ESV, you'll notice that verse 15 is in parentheses. Do you see that? It's, it's kind of like it's an aside. Um, in other words, John the Apostle, the, the author of this gospel, he's, he's just including this for extra merit. This is kind of, this is kind of an aside. It's a side explanation. And, and it's kind of random at first glance because look with me at verse 14, which we covered last week. So verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Remember, we talked about this last week, that we have this really stunning situation where God becomes man. The word, Jesus, becomes flesh. He becomes a human being, and he dwells among us. And remember, last week, we looked at the rich symbolism of that, and we saw that in Greek, the word dwell is the, is the same word that means tabernacle. In other words, John is very intentionally connecting to the fact of Old Testament Israel. Remember in our study, Old Testament Israel, in, inside of the camp, you had the tent called the tabernacle, and that's where God dwelled. That's where God's presence was. Remember, we talked about this last week, where if you want wanted access to God, you didn't have direct access to God. You had to go through a priest. And that is no longer the situation today. And it changes in John 1.14 where the word became flesh or where the word Jesus, God, tabernacled among humanity. In other words, Jesus himself is the very presence of God. And as the presence of God, he replaces the Old Testament tabernacle and the Old Testament sacrificial system. So we get that. That's big. That's huge. John is advancing a big truth. 
And then we get to verse 15. And in verse 15, we have an aside. It's in parentheses, and it's at first glance really doesn't seem like it fits. It seems out of place because we were just talking about the word become flesh. We were just talking about God become man. And in verse 16, he's going to return to that again. But then here in verse 15, he's talking about John the Baptist again. Why is he doing this? Why is he talking in verse 14 about the word become flesh? Verse 16, he's going to go back to the idea of the word become flesh. But here in verse 15, he's going to talk about John the Baptist Well, as we've already seen, John the Baptist was an impressive figure. Remember, he was we saw he was the first prophet in Israel in 400 years. He's someone that Jesus esteemed highly. Remember, Jesus said that that no one, no human being, no one born of man was greater than John the Baptist. But remember, as impressive and as great as John was, we saw that John's role was a role of a witness. He prepared the way for Jesus. He pointed others towards Christ. That was John's purpose. Matthew 3.3, 3. in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. So in verse 14, John the Apostle, the author of the gospel, makes a statement. And, it's, and it's, a, it's really an unbelievable statement. And the statement is this. God became a human being and we have seen his glory. John, the apostle, brings up John the Baptist as a witness to this. Because remember, John the Baptist is, a, is, a, is an important figure. He's a credible figure. He's a huge figure. He would have had the respect of all of the readers of John's gospel. And John, the apostle, is saying, look, I'm not just teaching you this. I'm not just saying this, that Jesus became flesh, that God became man. John the Baptist, whom you respect, whom you listen to, who Jesus himself called the greatest man that ever lived, he is the one who also taught this. He also taught that God became man. So John the Apostle, by including verse 15, which is why it's in parentheses, it's like a support. John made the statement in verse 14, God became man. And then verse 15, it's like, a, it's like a trial. He brings his witness to the stand and his witness is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist says, yes, I testify to that as well. And, look, and look, what, look what John the Baptist says in verse 14. John the Baptist bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. One of the recurring things that we're going to see as we look at the life of John the Baptist in the next coming uh, chapters, is we are going to see, and we've already seen it, is that John the Baptist, as impressive as he was, was an immensely humble person. And here his humility is seen in his pointing others towards Christ. John says, he, he says, the one who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. In the culture of Jesus' time, John the Baptist would have been viewed as preeminent. So if you saw Jesus and John standing together, more respect would have been given to John than to Jesus. Why is that? The reason why that is, is because John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. So in Jesus' time, the greater respect, the greater honor was given to those who were older. So if you were just humanly speaking to compare the two in that culture, people would have looked at John the Baptist as being the authority, not Jesus. They would have looked at John the Baptist, not Jesus, as being the honorable one, the more respectable one, the more authoritative teacher. But John, in humility, says, I'm not the one. Jesus, the one born after me, he is the one. John began his ministry before Jesus did. And being older, you know, having begun before Jesus, he would have had more respect than Jesus. But John the Baptist makes clear that Jesus ranks before him. Jesus is above him. John recognized that Jesus, being God, always existed. And we've seen this in verse in verse one through two. Remember, in the beginning of all time was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. John the Baptist recognized that Jesus was ahead of him. Jesus was above him. Jesus had a higher rank than him because Jesus is God and John is not. 
So that's verse 15. Verse 15, John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Now let's go to verse 16. Verse 16 reads this, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. So remember, verse 16 is connecting back to verse 14 because verse 15 is an aside. That's why it's in parentheses. So you could take verse 15 out and you really wouldn't lose much in the sense of argumentation. So verse 14, the word became flesh, God became man. We beheld his glory. We have seen God, verse 16, for from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The word here, fullness, comes from the Greek pleiorumia and it means fullness, full measure, abundance, or completion. The idea here of fullness is completeness. If you were to have a bucket and you were to take water and you were to fill it to the brim, that's what we're talking about. Fullness, completeness, that's the idea. So so John here, look what he says. This is is something that really should warm your heart. Verse, Verse 16 here says, From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. And what John is saying is simply this. We are complete when we get our satisfaction in Christ. Okay? Jesus completes us. He makes us full. He gives us abundant life. And this is the theme that is prevalent all throughout the Bible. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. But did you know that God actually invites us to enjoy Him? He calls us to find our fulfillment, our satisfaction, and our joy in Him. Listen to Psalm 1611. The the psalmist writes, You make known to me the path of life, In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So the psalmist in Psalm 16, he looks to David and he says, In your presence, God, there is fullness of joy. When I'm with you, I feel this immense joy. At your right hand, I feel pleasures forevermore. Do you think of your relationship with God that way? Do you think of your relationship with God as pleasurable? Or is your relationship with God just your duty? Oh, I have to read my Bible today. Check box. I have to pray today. Check. I have to go to church today. Check. That is not at all how we are supposed to view our relationship with God. Our relationship with God is supposed to be eminently pleasurable. Pleasurable. We are to experience pleasure in our relationship with God. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed or happy is the man who takes refuge in him. God like uses this word that, 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 that connects to the senses. It erases that, that touching sensation. Taste and see. Get an experience this joy in God for yourself. He says, when you're you're having this relationship with God, you are the one who is going to be happy. You're going to enjoy this sweetness. You're going to, you're going to, he uses this metaphor of eating. And I think all of us get this because all of us, like we all have our certain foods, foods that we really enjoy, that we really get excited about. Yesterday, I was up in Ure and I was at this place and I had this pizza and this pizza, it was okay, it was an okay pizza, but the pizza, instead of the marinara sauce, because I'm not crazy about like tomato sauce or marinara sauce, I got feta, feta sauce. So they took feta cheese and they made a sauce out of it. It was good. Like it was tasty. It, it, it touched my tongue in a way that marinara hadn't. There, there was a, there was, it was, it was a rich fla- flavor. Like it was like a, you know, like a ratatouille when, when he bites into the cheese or the grape and like, you know, he, he like blacks out and there's like these stars. That was not my experience yesterday, but it could have been if the pizza was better, you know. But all of us, we have those sensations. We enjoy food and we, we, we consume, we, we taste things and it's pleasurable to us. And God actually uses this kind of language talking about himself. Taste and see that the Lord 
is good. Isaiah 55, 1 through 3. Listen to God's heart here. He says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligent to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. Do you see that? God actually invites us. Come, everyone who thirsts, quench your thirst. Come to the water. He's given us water. All of us have thirst. All of us, all of us need our thirst quench. And God is using this metaphor here of water and food and wine to make a point. And here's the point. God doesn't want you to be satisfied with lesser things. He wants you to experience the highest joy and the highest pleasure that you're capable of. And because God loves you and he cares about you, he doesn't want you to settle for cheap imitation. He wants you to have a fresh baked pizza, not DiGiorno. Okay? He, he wants you to have the real deal. And the real deal is himself. He loves you enough that he invites you. Come, find your satisfaction in me. Find your delight in me. I will fulfill you. I will give you that fullness. And he asks us, he says, why, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And why do you labor for that which is, does not satisfy? Like God, God looks at humanity and says, why do, you, why do you pursue joy in people or things, in alcohol or sex or money or vocation? Like, why do you spend money for things which is not bread? Why do you go for that? Why do you chase after that? It, it's, it's empty. It's going to leave you hollow. He says, come to me. I will satisfy you. I will give you bread. I will give you milk. I will give you wine. And I will give it to you for free without price. You just have to come to me. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the source of of all of our fullness. So not only are we invited to take pleasure in our relationship with God, the Bible itself teaches that Jesus is the, the person, the source from which we receive fullness, completeness, where we're filled up to the brim. Listen to what Jesus says in John 10. He says, the thief comes only to steal and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus doesn't want to just redeem you and leave you. He doesn't just want to give you new life. He wants to give you abundant life. Life that is full. Life that is rich. He wants to give you true joy. How, how, how does this happen? How, how do we have this life? Well, he tells us in John 14, 4 through 5. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself... Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus says, he invites us, abide in me. Find your nourishment in me. Find your fulfillment in me. Find your life in me. As you go out and you can look at you can look outside and you, and you see a tree and you see the leaves or if you see a vine with the branches, you know, where do the leaves and where do the branches get their sustenance? They get it from the tree. The tree gets it from the roots. And Jesus is saying this, this abundant life that I want to give you, this fulfilling, satisfying life that I want to lavish on you, you're only going to get it in one place. And that's me. If a, if a branch is cut off from a tree, it's going to die. And if you are trying to live life without Christ, you will not find this nourishment. You will not find the satisfaction. You will not find this joy. In 2 Peter 1.3, uh, Peter describes Jesus. He says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory 
and his excellence. If you want to live life like you're supposed to live, like you should live, you must find that life and you can only find that life in Christ. He has given us life and he has given us godliness. Two passages that are especially helpful for us in in understanding what it means to experience the fullness of Christ are both found in Ephesians. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians and let's look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, because I want you you to see this. Starting in verse 11. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And, and, And... Paul here is talking about the church, and look look what he says here. He says, starting in verse 11, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, So that way we we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful deceitful schemes. So Paul, in in this chapter, in Ephesians 4, verse 11 through 14, Paul writes that God has given to the church several people, several offices. He gave the, 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 the office of prophet. He gave the office of apostle. He gave the office of evangelist. And then if you notice there, he gave the, the office, the shepherds and teachers. In the Greek there, that should really just be not two words, but one office, pastor, teacher. Okay. So, so Paul writes that God has given several offices to the church. Now of those offices, the office of apostle and the office of prophet are no longer around. These were foundational offices that existed with the founding of the church. There are no apostles today and there are no prophets today. If you hear people call themselves an apostle or a prophet, they are confused. They are no longer around. But two offices still remain. And that is the office of evangelist and the office of pastor teacher. An evangelist is someone who's been especially gifted with the ability to give the gospel to people. And we all know individuals like this. People who are especially prone to share the gospel with other people. The other office that still remains is the office of pastor teacher. That would be the elders at a church. In our context, that would be me. So the purpose for these offices, why did God give these offices and the two that are still around are the office of evangelist and the office of pastor teacher. Why, are the, why do they exist? Well, verse 12 tells us they exist to equip the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ. My job at Higher Ground Church is to equip you to do the work of ministry. How long will pastor teachers equip saints for the building up of the body of Christ. The time frame is found in verse 13. This will go on until we all attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of Christ. So much so, look what it says, that we would be conformed to his Christ, to his fullness. Look what it says in verse 13. To mature manhood, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. The goal is verse 14, that we would be mature. So much so, we would know so much about Christ, we would know his word, we would know doctrine, that we would not be blown about by every teaching that we hear. That is the purpose of the pastor teacher. He's to equip the church, teach the church, feed the church with knowledge of Christ, so that way they will experience the fullness of Christ So that way they will be able to refute false doctrine. So part of what it means to experience the fullness of Christ is to increase your understanding and your knowledge of Christ. And where do you experience your, your knowledge of, where do you increase the knowledge of Christ? You do so by reading his word, coming to church, and hear the divinely appointed person, the pastor teacher, to teach to you God's word. Right now, as I'm teaching to you God's word, simply explaining the text, you are experiencing the fullness of Christ. And I think all of us, all of us have experienced this before where we heard a sermon and something that we didn't quite understand, it just dawned on us. Like, like the light came on and we understood it for the first time. We said, whoa, I get it. Or maybe you were downcast, you were depressed, and you heard the word of God preached, and it encouraged your heart. It it renewed your affections. That's experiencing the fullness of 
Christ. So the first way we experience the fullness of Christ is by our experiencing the knowledge of Christ through the reading and the preaching of His Word. The second way is found here in Ephesians. So go back. So you're in Ephesians 4. Go, turn back to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, and let's look at, let's look at verse 17. Ephesians 3, 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, this is kind of a complicated passage, so put on your thinking caps, take another sip of coffee, because look at how these phrases are connected together. Paul prayed for the Ephesians that they would have strength to comprehend the length, height, and depth of the love of Christ. You see that? He says uh, in verse 18, um, may have strength to comprehend with the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that experience, that surpasses knowledge. That comprehension that understanding of Christ's love is being filled with the fullness of Christ. Experiencing the fullness of Christ comes not only from knowing Christ intellectually. We just read that. We just covered that. But experiencing the fullness of Christ comes from wrapping your mind around His love. From meditating on His love. From feeling in your heart God's very own love for you. Literally basking in the rays of the love of God. Resting and trusting in Him. Meditating on Him. Contemplating to yourself, wow, God loves me and He loves me so much. He died for me. And that, that kind of love, that, that, kind of, that kind of thinking really should stir your heart and make you just feel something, and that something you're feeling, that's the fullness of God, okay? So experiencing the fullness of God, remember, because we're, we're, turn back with me to John 1, John 1, 16, that he has, uh, our, our text very clearly states that from his fullness, we have received grace upon grace. Christ is the source of our fullness. He is the place where we go to be satisfied. He is the one who gives us true life, abundant life, joyful life, satisfying life, fulfillment. And this fulfillment, this experience of having the fullness of Christ comes from two things, increasing in your knowledge of God and basking, resting in the love of Christ, growing in your head and in your heart for Christ is experiencing the fullness of God. Let's look at this next phrase. He says, we have all received grace upon grace. Every believer experiences rich joy from Christ's fullness. And every Christian receives Christ who is grace upon grace. This word grace is the Greek word charis. Uh, you, might, you might know some people who are named charis. Charis is the Greek word for grace. It means favor, gift, or gratitude. From Jesus' fullness, every Christian receives grace. Every Christian receives grace. Favor. Jesus, from his immense full richness, lavishes grace upon us. Ephesians 1, 7 through 8. In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. God is pouring out grace on all of us. 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. God has so poured out His grace on you. If you're a Christian, truly Christian, meaning you've repented of your sin and asked God to forgive you, trusting that He is. If you've done that, God's poured out His grace on you, one, by saving you, but two, by adopting you, by making you His very own child. God's goodness spills over and pours all over us. He saves us by grace and he calls us his own. We have received grace upon grace. The question then is, what specifically is John the Apostle talking about when he uses this phrase, 
grace upon grace. He says, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Well, what is this grace? The answer is verse 17. From full, look, look what it says in the, in the next phrase here. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. Do you see what's going on there? John is literally saying, from his fullness, we have received grace upon grace. What is this grace? Verse 17, the law came through Moses. John is actually calling the law a grace. Now, when we talk about the law, we're we're usually talking about uh, the, the Old Testament Um, The first five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy, are sometimes called the law. Other times, we're talking about the Ten Commandments. When we talk about the law, you know, someone might say, oh, you know, you broke the the law of God, Ten Commandments, or you broke the law of God, meaning the first five books of the Bible, because there's a lot of, it's called the law of God because there's a lot of laws in there, okay? Nothing really, not rocket science here. And while both of these are acceptable understandings of the law, they're incomplete, because the law is a reference to, to the entire Old Testament system that God gave to Moses. That would include all of the rules and all of the regulations for the nation of Israel, and that would include the entire sacrificial system. When when John here says that we have received grace upon grace, for the law came through Moses, that's what he's referring to. All of the rules and regulations of the Old Testament and this entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament. And yet, John is going to call those things... God's grace. For many believers today, the Old Testament is irrelevant. It's nothing more than a collection of laws, regulation, and grotesque stories that have nothing to do with the Christian life. Today, many believers, in fact, pride themselves in their so-called Christian liberty, which they would define as their freedom from the law. Have you heard Christians talk about this? Oh, I don't have to do those things. I don't have to obey God because I've been free. I'm free from the law. This is my Christian liberty. And of course, that is not what Christian liberty is. But that is the very popular understanding of Christian liberty, that we are essentially free to live any way we want to because God's grace covers it. Now, it's bad enough that the common Christian believes that the law in the Old Testament is irrelevant. But what's even worse than that is that prominent pastors and teachers in evangelicalism today also teach this. Andy Stanley, you've probably heard his name before. He's an author. He has a book that is coming out or just came out. And he's a pastor of a 33,000 member church in Georgia. This is Andy Stanley, well-known, well-respected, well-listened to. He's on the radio, many Christians every day, they listen to Andy Stanley preach, read his books. Listen to what he said. Describing the early church, he says this. They unhitched the church from the worldview, value system, and regulations of the Jewish scriptures. Stanley continues. Peter, James, Paul elected to unhitch the Christian faith from their Jewish scriptures, and my friends, we must as well. So Andy Stanley actually got up there and said that the early Christians just disregarded the Old Testament. And if we're going to be faithful to the New Testament, we have to as well. He says that unhitching the Old Testament is liberating for people, listen to this, who need and understand grace, who need and understand forgiveness. And it's liberating for people who find it virtually impossible to embrace the dynamic, the worldview, and the value system depicted in the story of ancient Israel. Andy Stanley is literally teaching his 33,000 member church and his audience who listens to him on the radio that we need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. We need to disregard the law. It's meaningless. It's purposeless. It has no point in the Christian's life today. This position, if you want a $5 word, is called antinomianism, which means anti-law. And as we are going to see, it is very much unbiblical. Andy Stanley couldn't be more wrong. 
Far from unhitching the Old Testament, the New Testament writers and early church leaders actually saw the law for what it is. And they called it a grace. And they called it a grace because the law was not an end to itself. The law was a means to an end. It was a tool. It functioned for a purpose. And its functioning in that purpose was gracious. Okay? You're going to see what I mean in just a second. The law, the purpose of the law was not meant so that way people would, would puff themselves up in pride because of their obedience to it. Uh, this was the great error of the Pharisees. I mean, their entire worldview and religious system was built upon strict keeping of the law. They loved the law so much and they loved rules and regulations so much that they added to it. And they expected people to, to um, obey their man-made rules. But that was not the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was not even given so that way individuals can obey it perfectly. In fact, that is the law's purpose. The purpose of the law is to show us that it's impossible to keep. No one can obey the law. Absolutely no one. Just go through the Ten Commandments, and, and the Ten Commandments is only one little small part of the law. As I read through, think about yourself. Commandment one, you have no other gods before me. Okay. Commandment two, you shall make it for yourself. You shall not make for yourself an idol. All right. None of us, I think, have little idols in our closet that we light candles to and worship and bow down before. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, Commandment number three, you shall not misuse God's name. How many of you have done this? This isn't just swearing, by the way. This is any misuse of God's name. Commandment number four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Commandment five, honor your father and mother. Next commandment, you shall not murder Okay, good. Shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony about your neighbor, and you shall not covet. Many of us, all of us, have broken some of those laws in our lifetime. We all have. And Jesus, far from lightening the restrictions of the law, he actually, he actually adds to it. Like Jesus in the New Testament, he says, he says, yeah, murder's bad, but if you look at someone and you hate them, You've murdered them in your heart. That's as bad as murder, hating someone. He says that if you you look at another person with lust, which again, all of us have done that. Jesus says, you've committed adultery with them in your heart. How many of these laws, these are just the Ten Commandments. How many of these laws have you broken in your lifetime? How many of these Ten Commandments have you broken this week? How many have you broken? It's only 1130 in the morning. How many have you broken already today? The purpose of the law is not for us to obey it so that way we can have a relationship with God. That's impossible. The purpose of the law is to condemn us. It's to show us that we need a Savior and to point us towards Christ. In Hebrews 10.1, this is what the author says. The law was but a shadow of good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. It, it, the law points to Christ. It's a picture directing our attention towards Jesus. The law, which we've already demonstrated here, the law shows us that we are sinners. Uh, Romans 2.12, for all have sinned, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Romans 3.20 For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. So any religion that says that you must obey God and do these things, do this, do this, do this, do this, if you want to be justified or have a relationship with God, is wrong. That would eliminate uh, many religions. Um... So, yeah, it, the Bible says you're not, gonna, you're not going to get a relationship with God by the things that you do, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. The law tells you that you are a sinner. Romans 7.7. 7. I don't know if Annie Stanley has read this before or not. Well, look what Paul says. What shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it, it, yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For if it would not have said what is to covet, I would not know you shall not covet. So Paul says the law is not bad. The law is not sinful. The law shows us our sin. 
The law shows us, not only does it show us that we're sinners, the law shows us that we can't obey it and are therefore in need of a Savior. Galatians 2.16, you know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. We have also believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. Galatians 3, 21 through 22. Is the law contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law that had been, had been given that could give life, then righteousness would be by the law. So what Paul is saying is, is, is the law contrary to God's will? No. Paul says, if it were possible to give a law that you obey, obey this law and you're going you're gonna to go to heaven, then God would have done that. But he doesn't. Instead, the law, Paul says, in verse 22 of Galatians 3, but scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that, by the prom- so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. In other words, the law condemns. The law shows you you are a sinner. Galatians 3, 23 through 25. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the law. The law is called a grace because the law's purpose is to show us we need Jesus. The great early church father, Augustine, he said this. He says, and I love this. I love the the poetic beauty of this. He says, the law threatened, not helped. Commanded, not healed. Showed, not took away our feebleness. But it made ready for the physician who was to come with grace and truth. That's the law's purpose. It didn't come to heal us. It came to show us the position that we're in. So that way we can be prepared for, as Augustine calls him, the great physician, the one who will come and who won, who will deliver us, and that's Jesus. D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, he says, the law begins with commands and ends with blessings, but the blessings are fruit upon lofty branches which fallen man cannot reach. He cannot and will not climb the tree. The gospel on the contrary, begins with promises, and promises give birth to precepts. The law demands justice. The gospel delights in mercy through satisfied justice. Moses blesses the lawdoer. Jesus pardons the guilty and saves the lost. John here can refer to the law as grace because the law itself, not because, because of itself, it shows us that we are in need of a Savior and in need of Christ. It's kind of, the law is kind of like when you go to a doctor and he gives you a bad diagnosis. He tells you, I'm sorry to let you know, but, but you have a tumor. That's not good. That's not good news. That's condemning, crushing news. No one wants to hear that. But yet, even though it's bad, it's good. This is good news to hear because now you are aware of a problem that you weren't aware of before your appointment. Now you realize there's something wrong with you and now you can come up with a game plan to fix it. The same is true concerning the law. The law exposes us as sinners. It shows that we are sinful beings incapable of being holy. It shows us that we are in need of a senior, uh, in, need, in need of a savior, which leads to our very next phrase: grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was the first grace in that it reveals that we are sinners in need of a savior. The second grace is the grace upon gr- the grace upon grace that's mentioned is Jesus Christ, the one who brings grace and truth, which is none other than the gospel itself. The law condemns us, but Jesus alone, through the gospel, saves us. Jesus saves us by grace alone. Ephesians 2, 8-9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that way no one may boast. Jesus saves us solely by His grace. 
The gospel is the grace upon grace. It is the grace that saves. The law condemns, but the gospel saves. We see that that the manifestation of grace is found in Jesus' work on the cross. But not only does Jesus give us grace, he is truth. John 14, 6. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When you repent of your sin and when you place your trust in Christ, there is a great exchange. When you become a Christian, your sins are placed upon Christ and he covers you with his perfect righteousness. This is seen in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. He made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin. So that way in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Our sins are placed upon Christ and his righteousness is placed upon us. We are not ourselves righteous. We are covered by the blood of the Lamb, and we are in Christ, which means His righteousness covers us like a cloak, like a coat. John Piper contrasts this, contrasts this well. He writes this. The contrast is that Moses and the law points to grace, but Jesus performs grace. Moses and the law reports the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. The law mirrors the light of God, But Jesus is the light of God. Moses gave manna from heaven, but Jesus was the true bread from heaven. Moses wrote about Christ, but Christ was Christ. The law of Moses was the word of God, but Christ was God the word. So in summary then, what am I getting at with this verse, these these couple of verses? Because there's a lot of confusion, and maybe you're not following along. Here it is. Jesus is our fullness. All our wants, needs, and joy is found and supplied in Him. He has poured out His grace upon us. The first grace is the law. Not because it's an, it's an end of itself, but because it's a means to an end. It's a tool. And the purpose of that tool is to show us that we are in need of sinners and that we, that we are sinners in need of a Savior. That's the first grace. That we are condemned and we need a Savior and we would not know it had the law not showed us. The second grace is the the grace upon grace is the gospel itself. The law condemns us. It shows us we are sinners, but Christ through his gracious work on the cross saves us. All right, point two. And this is the the second big takeaway concerning Jesus' character. Verse 18. Jesus is the explanation of God. Look what John writes here. He says, no one has seen God, the only God. Remember last week we we covered the the topic of God's glory. And and we saw that Jesus, or we saw that Moses went up to the mount and he he asked God to show him his glory. Remember this? Moses goes up there and he asks God, you know, show me, please show me your glory. And, And God says to him, I will give you a little glance of me. Because no one can see me and live. And you remember the story. He puts Moses in a rock, a little cleft of a rock. And he covers Moses with his his hand. And God passes in front of Moses. And Moses just gets a tiny little glimpse of the back of God. And that tiny little glimpse of God makes Moses radiate. And he's literally glowing when he comes down from the mountain. And the truth of this is, had had God not placed Moses... In that rock, and had God not covered Moses with his very own hand, had Moses actually looked directly at God, Moses would have died because no one can actually see God. No one can look at God. But look what it says here No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, except the implication here is for Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can see God because Jesus himself is God. And we can see God because we can look to Jesus and there we see God. He says that he's the one who is at the Father's side. Jesus alone is is in God's presence. Notice what John says. He's at the Father's side. And, And unfortunately, this is very intimate language. And what's unfortunate is that none of our translations, even a good translation like the ESV, it doesn't it doesn't really capture doesn't really capture here. We're kind of viewing it in black and white, but the Greek is in color. The, the, the wording here at the Father's side is literally ace toin kolpon, which I know you don't know what that means, but it literally is this, that Jesus is in his lap. 
Jesus, God's only son, is in the Father's lap. As God's son, he has intimacy with God. He, Jesus, the one who has this kind of relationship with God, was made flesh. And, and he is the one that, look at that last phrase, he is the one that has made him known. He is the one that has made God known. This word here, know, is the word exegomai, exegomai, and it means to tell, make known, describe, or report. It's used only six times in the entire New Testament, and and it's used in context where individuals are telling an event that happened. So it's used in Luke 24 when you have the two guys walking on the road to Emmaus. Jesus appears to them. Jesus explains to them the whole Bible. And then they eat together, and then Jesus reveals to him that they're Jesus, that he's Jesus. And they're like, whoa, what just happened? And then he disappears. So these two, they go and they find the disciples, and they, the word here is they told, it's, that, it's the same word here for known. They told the disciples what happened. They, they fully explained what happened. They gave an account for what happened. Um, it's used in Acts 15 in a similar situation where Paul and Barnabas are explaining to the disciples uh, about God's work here. The point is this, the word exegomai means to explain something. It means to fully recount something, to fully tell something, to make something known in its fullest sense. Um, so if, you, if you're reading out of a, new, uh, like the ESV says, he has made him known, the New American Standard actually gets is the better translation. It says, he has explained him. This is the word that we get our word exegesis from. Exegesis means to draw out of a text. So like when I'm studying for the week, for the sermon, I'm doing exegesis. I'm, I start off with the Greek passage, and I have the Greek New Testament in front of me, and I look, and I read it in Greek, and I look at the grammar, and I see, okay, how does this word relate to this word? And, and, I, and I pull out from there the, 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 the meaning. I'm pulling out the meaning from the text, and I'm teaching it to you, and that's called exegesis, okay? Why do I say that? I say that because that's the same word used here to describe Jesus. Jesus is the exegesis of the Father. He is the explanation of the Father. In other words, if you want to know what God is like, because none of us can see God, God's invisible, and if you could see God, it would kill you. If you want to know what God the Father is like, you look to Christ, because Christ is the explanation of God. Christ has explained God. He, uh, John, uh, John 12, 44 through 45, Jesus cried out, whoever believes me, believes not in me, but him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. In John 14, Jesus says, if you had seen me, known me, you would know my father also. For, for now on, you do know him and have seen him. And then verse eight, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father. It is enough for us. And then Jesus responds to Philip this way. He says, Philip, have I been with you long, so long, and you still do not know me? Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say to me, show me the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? So Jesus, not only is he the source of fullness, which we've seen, not only is he grace and truth, which we've seen, but Jesus is the very explanation of God. If you've seen Jesus, you have seen the Father. All of us long for knowledge of God. All of us crave knowledge of God because all of us were made to know God. We can actually despair by our lack of knowledge of God. If you want to know God, you look to Christ. Jesus explains God to us. He shows us who God is because he is the one who is intimate with God and he shares that intimacy with us. So in conclusion, two big takeaways from this passage this morning. Number one, Jesus is our fullness. He is our satisfaction. He is our fulfillment. He is our joy. We are commanded to experience his fullness. And this is done by two ways, remember? By increasing our knowledge of God through the reading and preaching of his word and by soaking in the ocean of his love. That is how we experience Christ's fullness. Secondly, Jesus, from his fullness, offers us grace and truth. 
Are you consuming his grace? Are you feeding yourself with his grace? If not, I would strongly encourage you this morning to be doing that. Be reading his word. Be praying. Be making relationship with Jesus the priority in your life every single day. Reading his word. Praying. Attending church. Meditating on his love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these rich truths that you have you have shown us. God, it is incredible to see your full nature in Jesus. We thank you that Jesus is the very explanation of God. We thank you, God, that you did not leave us on our own to kind of come up with who you are, to come up with, with our understanding of you, but you have given us Jesus, the living word, and you've given us the Bible, which is the written word. So God, I pray for everyone in here this morning that you would help all of us to be reading your word every day, to be praying to you, to be having this intimate relationship with you, this experiencing this fullness. And God, I ask that you would satisfy our hearts. Make us fall in love with you, God. Help us to, to have our joy and our pleasure in you. Christ, then we pray. Amen.